Okay, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Glad to see people piling in here very quickly. I'm Cynthia Allen, and I'm super pleased here to be with you. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself here in a minute. But first, why don't you just start by throwing in the chat where you're from. Put that in the chat and introduce yourself. So you might even find somebody from your own city, your own community. So what are we going to be doing here today? Well, we're going to be doing a couple of booms for life processes. Uh, you might think of them as exercises, but we think of them as processes. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, we'll be having an opportunity for you to record a power moment. And in that recording of your power moment, you'll also get a chance to be entered into a drawing for some cool things. So I do recommend that you take notes. These three sessions are very packed and I understand that you can watch the replays again later, but uh, I think that if you take notes, in fact, this research shows if you take notes, you anchor things into your own learning. And that's part of what we wanna do with the power moment too, is to anchor things in their own learning. Oh, we like that warmest love from Florida, thank you. Um, and then I also just wanna say a kind of a signature thing I say these days is that you know, we're going to have hundreds here today and we'll have thousands watching it on replay. And it's important that we recognize that there's millions of ways of being and doing human. And it's, uh, I understand that some of us come and we're not pleased with our way of doing human right now or being human right now, but it's super important that we recognize that we all need to have different ways of navigating life. That's what's gonna allow you to stay safe. It's also what's going to allow you to learn what you really need to learn. So releasing judgment about all the different ways that we stand and we walk and we move and we don't stand or we can't walk or we can't move and just settling in to uh, the fact that it's actually really wonderful that there's millions of ways of doing human. It's a beautiful thing. I'm Cynthia Allen. I have 40 years of experience in healthcare management and programming. Started out in wellness programming 40-ish years ago. I'm also a Guild Certified Feldenkrais Practitioner, and I'm a Senior Trainer in Movement Intelligence, uh, which is the umbrella that holds Ruthie Alon's work and Bones for Life. My husband, Larry Wells, and I are partners in life and in business. And then that's uh, Future Life Now is our business. And that's the company that brings you this series. We have a gorgeous Woodle here in Cincinnati that's kind of become a little bit of our uh, company mascot. But Darby was hit by a car eight weeks ago. Really did a number on his pelvis. So he is recovering from reconstructive surgery. And I'll tell you that process of watching his healing and growth, which I've watched in, you know, my family members and I've watched in clients, but there's something about watching it in a little being like a dog that I really appreciate the stages of healing in, in such a major way and how pain interrupts pain and immobility interrupts our free expression of ourselves. So to watch the moment when Darby would just get a little bit of a woof back, couldn't woof for days, didn't woof for days. And then suddenly he just has a little woof, woof, right? And then the day he might have a bark. Oh, three weeks in, maybe a bark. Arf! And then to watch until just in the last week, has he had a series of barks showing that he notices the squirrels and then he's ready to or he thinks he might be ready to go chase them again. So that's what happens to all of us. It happens to every one of us when something throws us back on our haunches. I also have here with me today, Andrea Tut. And we're gonna bring up Andrea. Thank you all for that. Add Andrea to our mix here. And Andrea is one of the teachers that we have here in the, uh, our Bones for Life training under Future Life Now. And uh, Andrea, so glad to have you. Glad to have you on the team. Glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Happy yeah. to be. So Andrea is going to be doing some team teaching here with me today. I'll be starting off 
with uh, a little bit of information and a movement process. And then Andrea will, and a case study, and then Andrea will pick up with a movement process and a case study. So we have really good things for you to feed both your mind and your body and your spirit. Andrea has a studio here in Cincinnati called Attune, which is uh, a both a Pilates studio, but it also has a lot of bones for life in it these days. And she is a actress and a director of theater productions, and she teaches uh, movement. I guess that's what she'll say. It's called movement for young actors at the university setting as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll pop back to you in a little bit, Andrea. Besides these movement processes and case studies and some basic information, we're also going to be sharing at least two backbone principles of Bones for Life that really can help you unlock your healing potential. That same thing that I witnessed in Darby. Well, humans, but even animals, they sometimes need a little extra help. They need a little extra help. Hard to hear me. Okay. Yeah, we got a few comments on that, Cynthia. Well let's, well, let's see if we can fix that. Is that better? Is that better? It's not hot for anybody. Let's try that for a little bit. So, wow. In the U.S., in the United States, falls are the leading major cause of adults ages 65 and older. Over 14 million or one in four adults will report a fall every year. Hmm. These are numbers from our CDC, um, which tracks uh, accidents and morbidity for us. They're the leading cause of injury related death among adults ages 65 and older, and the fall death rate is increasing. The age-adjusted fall death rate increased by 41% from 2012 to 2021. 41%. That's incredible. Now, that's the, the title of today's session, right, is Stand Tall, Don't Fall. So we are here to start to address the problem of posture, as well as the ability to stand, to adapt to changing conditions so that we do not fall. Now, you may think those two things don't go together, but before people ever start thinking about their fall risk, back in their 20s and 30s, they start thinking about posture. And posture, I'm going to say, is tied to fall risk. I'm going to say that again. Posture is tied to fall risk. I feel confident if someone really takes the time to study that, these things are tied together. And I hope I help you understand that quite clearly. Traditionally, Posture is thought of as chest out, shoulders back, squeeze those shoulder blades, tuck the, tuck the chin. And you may even feel like the posture is thought of as stiff, right? Stiff. Sometimes we have that image of the armed forces coming up to say, right? Attention. But starting, starting early in adult life, there's people that want better posture. Generally, posture is not an issue that we address so much for kids because kids are going through all kinds of stages of self-expression and they will hide themselves and show themselves and stand one way and stand another way, all as part of trying to fit into social norms. But then as we get into our twenties and thirties, many of us start to realize, Oh, we just don't look so good slumped over or gosh, I'm so tired all the time. It's just hard to hold myself up. So this poor posture is the setup for decreasing balance and an inability to adjust to unexpected balance changes. And yet it is not, good posture is not to be stiff. It is not to have the chin tuck. It is not to have the shoulder blades back. It is not to thrust the chart chest out. Those are all individual pieces of something that needs to be incorporated into a whole. And when you treat them as individual pieces, you get a stiffness, a lack of mobility an inability to respond to the changing circumstances around you. Now I'd like to 
show you uh, a basic spine model because there are people here today that, you know, they don't know so much about the parts of the spine. And I'm going to be using some words here and I want them to make sense to you. So this is the back of the base of a skull. The whole head would be right here. And we have here what are called the seven cervical vertebra, which is your neck. And we see these little pointy processes off the back called the <clears throat> spinous process. And you can put your own hand back on your neck right now. And you can feel the base of your skull in, in a kind of, usually there's a little bit of a knot or a ridge there. <clears throat> so I'm going to say, if you're continuing to have trouble with the if I turn it up any higher, it's going to get hot. So there's some of you are saying it's quite fine. And some of you are saying it's not. I'll just check something else here. And yeah, it's up quite high, even on the Zoom level. So I would say sign out and sign back in if you continue to have trouble with your volume. You'll only miss about 30 seconds to a minute. Okay. And see what it ha see what happens. Now, these are the, so these are the seven cervical vertebra and you can use your own hand to feel the bottom of your skull. And then you can kind of run your fingers down the middle of the ridge of the neck and you'll sort of feel some of these bony processes. You might not feel all seven of them, but you'll feel some of them. And then you'll come down here to an area where at the top of your torso, it feels like there's a knot. A bit of a knot. Now, on some of us, that knot is larger than others, than on others, but most everybody has one. And that's going to be your beginning of your thoracic spine. It's the bottom of your neck and the beginning of your thoracic spine. You know, so your thoracic spine, we often think of as covering the upper back. This is the area between your shoulder blades, the top of your torso and your shoulder blades, and your mid back, and your mid back. And you start to see that there's some curves here, right? Here's the neck. Here's the mid back, the thoracic. And then as we come down past those 12 thoracic, and you could maybe reach around and touch a thoracic vertebra from the back, from the back. You could go, oh, yeah, there. Oh, yeah, there's something. There's something you might be able to with one hand or another. But they're not easy to reach, are they? And then we come down here into the lumbar area and we have usually five lumbar vertebra. And this is the area that starts sort of behind your waist or belt line and then goes down further than that until you get to your pelvis, your sacrum, and then of course your coccyx way down here. So the sacrum is that big triangular bone here. Now, if I show this whole thing on the screen, looks like I can just keep scooting my chair back. So I'll do that for a moment. You can see that there's curves here. We do not want to straighten the spine. We don't. We want to restore it to its natural, healthy curves. We do not want to straighten the spine. We want to restore it to its natural, healthy curves. And we're going to start that basic process of understanding and knowing here in just a moment. In Bones for Life, this somatic movement approach, somatic education approach developed by Ruthie Alon, it was inspired by these African women who carry loads on their heads. And they were very well studied. The studies are about 20 years old now, but well studied that they could carry up to 20% of their body weight. So big surprise, I don't weigh 100 pounds, but if I weighed 100 pounds, I'd be able to carry 20% uh, of my body weight. I'd be able to carry 20 pounds on my head without increasing my energy, energy expenditure. It means I don't even get any little bit of uptake in my breathing. I don't wear out. In fact, as they carry loads on their head, they actually, their gait, their walking style becomes more efficient, cleaner. Now, 
in those cultures, sometimes they're carrying 20 to 50% of their body weight on their head. And we're not saying that's healthy. We're not saying that uh, African women who do this don't have a difficult life because many of them do in fact have a difficult life. But these cultures in which loads were carried on the head, Ruthie Yalan said, they know something. They know something that we don't know. And she really looked at their gait. She studied the way that they walked. And that is filtered throughout the Bones for Life program. And that is filtered throughout these processes that we're going to be exploring today. One of the things that you see for these women is that they know how to carry the weight of their own head on their spine. That's very, very important that they can carry the weight of their own head on their spine. So, well, what, is that, what does that mean? It means that is, the head is not forward. It's not way off to one side or the other. And the head is also not behind. Now you can kind of imagine how challenging it would be to carry a load on your head if your head is tipped forward, if your head is way forward. Can you imagine the weight pressing down on your head? It would be significant, wouldn't it? It would be significant. So we wanna be sure if you're one of those women and it's not, there are cultures where men carry weight, but they often don't carry it on their head. They carry it as a band around their forehead often. But this was the culture that really grabbed Ruthie's attention. So you can imagine if you're carrying a, a bushel of, I don't know, 20 figs or dates might be more like maybe what they would have in, in their environment that you don't want these rolling around items being subject to a head that tilts. And you also don't want a head that's way forward being pushed down even more by the weight that's on your head. So this quality of being able to reach up, reach up and lengthen through the spine, not straighten the spine, but lengthen through the spine. Lengthen in such a way that the weight can sit on the middle and front of the body of the spine, on the middle and front of the vertebral bodies. This is a beautiful area of the spine and we all know it because it's accessible for us and, and we can kind of see it in other people and we can kind of feel it in ourselves. But so much of the power of what we need is right here. And this is where we wanna be stacking our head on top of. So we really need a new definition for posture. We need a different word for posture. I call it dynamic postural balance because posture and balance are intertwined. And a posture that cannot adapt moment to moment, whether that's a, a bushel of apples on your head or a, th a jug of water where water is sloshing back and forth with every step, or it's because somebody presses you, pushes you, and you go, whoa, okay, hey, somebody pr pushed me. Or you step on a surface that's a little uneven and you have to refine your balance you have a posture that has to be dynamic to the moment. So we want to get away from thinking of it as a static item and see if we can bring ourselves to understanding it as a very dynamic process. Now we call Bones for Life exercises, what you might usually call them processes. And why do we call them processes? because learning is a process. You aren't just building muscle or bone with these movements, you're building neural pathways. You're building awareness. You're building an overall health that's engaged from the system level, not at a local muscular level, not at a localized joint level, 
although those things may improve, but we're working to create a uh, consensus, Ruthie Alon often called it, a consensus within your nervous system, a consensus between all the parts of yourself that allows you to do the things that you want to do in your life. So we're going to start with a couple of check-ins with you. So here's definitely having a little pencil and paper, or maybe you take notes on a computer. I'm going to give you a poll. And um, why don't you either sit at the front of your chair and just feel how you are sitting unsupported. Or if you want to stand for a moment, you can stand for a moment. And I'd like you to just tune in to without making any changes. This is hard. Don't change a daggone thing. Without you making any changes, how happy do you think you are with your posture right now? No changes. How happy does you feel with your posture right now? And then I'm going to give you a scale. And the scale is really technical. Number one is UG. UG. I don't like it. And number 10 is yippee, I'm rocking it. Can you give yourself a number on that scale of one to 10 and write it down? This is going to be your pre number. And later, after we do these processes, you're going to get to report your pre and your post number. So it's very important that you write down your pre number. You can also put it in the chat that I want you to record it for yourself as well. So we see some of them rolling in in the chat. Let's see if I can get the chat in a better place for me to. We're going to have about an hour and 15 minutes, maybe as long as an hour 30, that'll be uh, Andrea and I teaching. And then we'll stick around for another 30 minutes for question and answers. Uh, so, okay, we got... Somebody that says a three, eight, five, one, six or seven, uh, seven, five, one, four, five, six, seven, eight, six, seven, four. So we've got some variety here. We have quite a bit of variety. Yeah. Okay. Now let's try another one. <clears throat> And this one you might do better if you're somebody who can stand doing it standing and thinking to yourself. So let's imagine that you're standing and maybe somebody brushes up against you. Maybe they brush up against you in a pretty significant way. Or maybe you're asked to do that balance test where they ask you to stand on one leg for one minute and then the other leg for one minute. Or maybe you're asked to walk super slow. And when people have a lot of balance trouble, they don't usually wanna walk super slow unless they have a walker or poles, something to help them out. So now here's a second poll about your stability or your ability to recover your equilibrium. You ready? So one is, I'm a puffball. I could lose balance very easily. I'm a puffball. I could lose balance very easily. And 10 is, yeah, I can stand on one leg, each of my one legs, whichever one leg, both of them, but at one at a time for a minute. I can walk super slow without any aids. If someone bumps into me, I feel really secure. Okay. One is I'm a puffball. I lose balance easily. 10 is I can stand on each leg individually up to a minute. I can walk super slow. Someone could bump into me. I feel secure. Get down here to where I think the new numbers are going to come in. Nine, eight, seven, seven. Okay. Nine, three, five, six, 10, 10, three, Six, five, seven, one, six. Okay, we've got one, three, four. So let's see what we can do to improve that with the processes that we're going to be teaching you today. 
So the first process that we're going to be working with is called bouncing on heels. And for those of you who can sit at, for those of you who can stand safely, you'll come to stand. If you think you can, you know, like I can normally stand safely, but I'm not real sure about my balance. You could stand and put your hands on the back of a chair or sofa. If you're not able to stand right now, you would sit if possible at the front of a very stable chair. So let's take a look at Brian is going to be showing us what it looks like at the sitting at the front of a chair. Yeah, thank you. And Brian, could we see a side view of that too? So you see how most of his thighs are free from the chair and his feet are on the ground. And Brian, if you snug up a little closer to the wall, I think you'll see your feet. Perfect. Do you need to have your shoes off for this? If you're safe to have your shoes off for it, it's nice. I think it's healthy to have shoes off. But if you have some reason that you need to have shoes on, then keep them on. Now, notice that Brian is sitting in a way. Do you feel like you're going to fall off the chair, Brian? Great. So you, that's one of your tests is you want to be sure that you feel that you're okay on the chair. And if you're not, you back yourself up a little bit. If you can't do this and you could put a pillow behind your back and support yourself, you could do that. Or you can even lean back to start off with. You begin with where you're able to go. Now, if we look at Andrea, Andrea's going to stand to, for this for us. Beautiful. <clears throat> and we can see that Andrea's just found a nice, easy spot to stand in. We can see her head to toe a little bit. And if she needed balance, she could have a chair there to put her hands on the back of it. She doesn't need that, so she won't be demonstrating that. Okay, so we got everybody. Let me just look through and see how you all are doing. Good. Oh, great. Looks like people are ready. Okay, so bring your hand to your heart, your right hand to your heart. And let's just get a rhythm together. And the rhythm is going to be a light double tap. That's it. A beautiful, light little double tap. And then we're going to put a vocalization with it. It's spelled P-U-M, P-U-M. And the vocalization goes pum, 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 pum. pum. So there's light quiet lightness to the words pum pum, right? A light sort of elevating quality to them. And as we say them a little longer, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, we can kind of imagine that all around the world, our hearts are synchronizing, yeah? Our voices are synchronizing and we're together in a great big giant circle. Okay, let's let that go for a moment. Now that's going to be the rhythm and the pulse that we'll be using. Let's use your hands right now, though, to, to figure out what's going on with your curves already. So you bring one hand behind your neck and you could just stroke up and down a little bit and get a sense of the curve of your neck. Feel the top of the skull, maybe feel the bottom of the neck. How deep is the curve there? And then take your hand down. And ask yourself the question, is my head sitting in front of my neck, on top of my neck, behind my neck? Don't fix anything. The process will lead you to a more organic solution than anything you can do on your own. And then notice your low back, I mean, yeah, let's do the low back. Let's notice the low back and you can put maybe one hand behind the low back and you can stroke up and down there and ask yourself the same thing. Like how much of a curve do I have here? We call it an in curve, a curve towards the front of your body. It gets called a lordosis. You should have a curve there. Not everybody will have one, but most of us do. And how big is that curve right now? And then lower your hand and let's tune in to the shape of your chest. Does your chest feel thrust forward, collapsed, hidden, withdrawn, pushed out, lifted up, folded down? 
And how does that affect the shape of your upper back behind? Is that curved? So we should have a little bit of an out curve in the thoracic spine. But if we get too much, we get a change of deeper curves in the neck and in the lumbar. So these three curves are constantly in interaction with each other. And you can't correct one without affecting the others. Okay, let's let that go. And then also notice how your weight is on your feet. Does your feet mostly, does it weight mostly in one foot or the other? Like one foot is heavier on the ground, would be harder to lift. Is your weight mostly towards the front of your feet or towards the back of your feet? Okay, so now we're going to come to using this rhythm, a double tap and pum pum on our heels. We're going to lift our heels. So uh, Andrea is going to turn to the side for us. And we're going to take a look at Andrea doing this pum pum. And let's see if you can get into the same rhythm with her. So pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum. Good, let that go. And unless you're somewhere that's embarrassing for you to be saying pum pum, try to use your mouth now. And let's take a look at Brian doing it in sitting from a side view. Pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum. Yeah, pause there. Now, Brian could also add his fists on his knees and he could get an extra stimulation of his bones by using his fist and his heels at the same time. So if you're in sitting, you can do this. Okay, good, let's pause for a moment. Everybody's got their setup now. So I'm gonna begin to lead this for you and using your voice and finding your way to bounce on your heels lightly. Oh, what would that be? We say it's 20% or less of what you can do. So we're not doing big tall calf raises with a big thud. We're doing a, huh, huh. It's, that's why we're doing a double tap. It's hard to raise high and get down. You will, if you raise high, you have to come down and you have to come back up. Your amplitude is high. The space between them will be very long. So this pum pum rhythm is very important. Ready? Pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum. Pum, 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 let it go. Pause and just stand for a moment or sit for a moment, just feel. Now, just this simple bouncing on heels has changed for many of you something about your weight in your feet. And some of you already noticed something happening across your shoulder blades and your arms and your collarbones, not everybody. Well, let's work with the alignment of the neck next. So bring one hand behind your neck and the other hand to be on your chest and spread your fingers behind. Let's see what Andrea is going to show us here with the fingers. Can you turn your back towards us there? Spread your fingers so that your little finger is at the base of the skull and your index finger is at that knot at the top of your trunk. So this is grabbing the cervical vertebra sort of, and then you sort of spread your fingers out in between and feel the deepest part of the in curve in your neck and put your middle finger there. Well, how would you find that? How about you look up a little bit and you look down a little bit and you look up a little bit. And when you look up, you'll feel one of your vertebra makes a bigger in curve than others. For a while, you might guess at this, like as in weeks, you might guess at this. It's okay to guess. Guessing is better than not guessing. Put your middle finger in that spot. Now, bring your head down on the horizon, even though your finger's in the same place. Soften your chest a little bit. So that'll probably drop your head a little bit, right? And then use your hand on your chest, like as if you had it glued to your chest and press the chest up and back. So it's a kind of lifting, but also taking it in the back direction. 
and feel if that starts to increase the distance between your fingers. Can you find a way to use the hand on your chest to increase the distance between your fingers? Now, in between movements, you drop down again. So we don't hold it. You drop down, you let your chest sink again, hand behind the neck, and then you press again. So Andrea, could you just drop down out of that just a little bit more so people can see it? There you go. And then again, that's it. And we can see how her shape of her spine is changing. Can you feel it in yourself? Hey, when your back of your neck gets long, your low back arches. That's wild. Now stay there with your hand on the back of your chest in that lifted position, your fingers spread, and let's bounce on heels. Let's send pressure through this new alignment. Pum, 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 last one. Let it go. Swipe your hand up and bring it down. Bring your other hand down off your chest. Hmm. And just stand and feel and sit and feel. Now, having your arms up, for some of you, very difficult. The way that you take your hand up, by the way, may make a difference. So if you were taking it up this way, that might be very hard. But you could take it up more the center of your body and sort of slide it around. You don't have to have your elbow way out, by the way. So those are some things that might make it easier for some of you. Hmm. Feel now your weight on your feet, on your buttocks if you're sitting. And some more changes are happening. The more that you do it, the more that you notice, the more changes that, have, that will happen. How about we work with the lumbar next? So if we take a look at Brian now, Brian is going to be placing, or we're all going to be placing our hand on our belly. And we want our fingertips to be right above the pubic bone. It's a little harder in sitting. So we'll do right above the pubic bone and the thumbs right around the belly button. So they're kind of spread. And then we're going to use the fingers to nudge the skin upwards towards the thumbs and then let it go. And you will use the fingers to nudge the skin from above the pubic bone up towards the thumbs. Now, this is a passive change in the shape of your pelvis and your low back. Yeah. Can you feel that your low back lengthens? If you're standing and you feel that the low back is actually not doing anything, it might be because your knees are locked. Could you soften your knees just a little bit? So now we're gonna bring that up and change the relationship of the curve of the low back. And we're gonna send pressure through this new relationship. We have passively changed it. We are not actively doing a pelvic tilt. Do not actively do a pelvic tilt. Make this a passive change with your hands. And we can take a look at Andrea again, and we're going to bounce on heels together. As you keep that belly in that up position, pum, 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 last one. Beautiful. Those of you who are standing, if you've decided, hey, this is too much standing, I need to go to sitting now, you can do that. Those of you who are sitting, if you need to take a rest back against the back of the chair, you can do that. You can also walk around for just a moment and feel a refreshment in walking around. It's totally fine. Now, some of you may have noticed that, hey, when I lifted the belly and lengthened the low back, my neck got a bigger arch. What the heck? That happens for almost everybody. When you lengthen the neck, the low back gets a bigger arch. When you lengthen the low back, 
the neck gets a bigger arch. You cannot not affect the other curves. Although it's harder to affect the thoracic, the middle and upper back curve. It's a very encased part of the spine. It has the ribs attaching to it and it comes around and creates attachments to the best bone and we get this rib cage. So now we want to lengthen both curves at the same time. So we're going to put one hand, I'm sorry, one hand on the chest and one hand on the belly. And you kind of collapse down a little bit. So you've got some place to go. You aren't trying to be super, super straight. And then you bring the chest up as you also lift the belly. And see if you can begin to feel like, oh, that's interesting. I'm getting a longer neck and I'm getting a longer lumbar at the same time. And that means the thoracic area, which tends to round in so many of us, is starting to change. And now this next time that you have it lifted, stay there and we'll do our last pum pum. Pum pum, 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 pum pum. Last one. Thank you. Now, feel yourself for a moment in your sitting and standing position. This isn't the end of what we're gonna do, but you might have a, in your mind, you might be going, huh, my posture does feel a little bit better. I think I could bump it up a number or two already. And we're gonna do more, we're gonna do more. Okay. Please let that go. If you want to walk around for a minute before you come to a seat, do that. I'm going to get ready to take you into a little bit of a different discussion as well as a case study before we go to Andrea with new movement. So we're just going to keep mixing it up. But first, you came to this series because you have something you want out of it. You have some kind of challenge, some kind of challenge, something that you're got in mind. And we would love it if you began to share those in the chat. And while you're doing that, I'm going to start to share my screen for you. And let's make sure I got the right thing. Katrina, you're seeing just the screen for um, Bones for Life. In the middle. Uh, I'm yeah, I'm seeing two slides. You're seeing two slides. Okay, so I don't have, quite have it right. Let me try that again. I need under challenge. I start to hum. I almost <laughs> got to hear some really bad humming. That's not what I want. Okay, so there it is. Trying a different way to do this so that the right thing shows for you. Okay, here we go. That's good. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking through here to see what all you've got. Oh, gosh, this is excellent. This is so helpful for us to hear what you're here for. It'll help us in the rest of the series. Beautiful. Thank you. Just keep sharing those as you like. It's helpful to us. And, um, and we want you to know that we will read them and hear you. So, Bones for Life, it's rooted in the teachings of Moshe Feldenkrais. So he was a pioneer in somatic education. And Ruthie Alon, the creator of Bones for Life, is a pioneer in somatic education. Somatic education is its own field of inquiry and organic learning. Somatic movement is a big term right now, but it's being used for everything under the sun. And you cannot call somatic education exercise. It just simply is not. 
So it's not just any kind of movement of the body, which is what the word soma means is body. So soma, somatic movement has no definition other than movement relating to the body. Um, but somatic education does. And the, there's many items that fit under somatic education and they're all around this action of inquiry, organic learning or learning from the inside out. It's also been inspired by African women, as I've talked about. We can see one of these women that a colleague of mine uh, was able to take a picture of a few years ago when she was in Africa. And then Ruthie Alon also had a desire to make somatic education digestible for all because somatic education tends to be uh, big. Most of the other expressions of it tend to be really big and hard to take in for the average person. This is Ruthie Alon. She was about 85 when this picture was taken. She died at 90. It's only been gone two and a half years. I think it's be three years this coming December. Beautiful woman, a beautiful spirit, so incredibly creative. Now, I said we were going to be sharing some backbone principles with you, and we've really shared two with you. I think we've shared more than that, but I want to call out these two. One is 20% pressure and effort allows safety, it allows new learning, and it allows stimulation to your musculoskeletal health. And a lot of her ideas around this 20% effort comes from uh, the studies done in low intensity vibration, which showed that low intensity vibration is one of the most effective ways to affect stem cell health. This is not the same as um, some of the vibration that you see out there today. Most of them do not fit low intensity vibration. They mostly do not fit 20%. But 20% is the threshold that is safe for all human beings to take in repeatedly, day after day, year after year. Higher than that, it gets to be um, problematic on all kinds of levels. Extremely well studied by um, occupational organizations around the world. And the second one that I've shared with you is the restoration of natural spinal curves, that we are not trying to straighten the spine. When we say alignment, when we say lengthening in this work, we're talking about a particular area that we may have developed that just has a bit of excessive curve, something that just comes out of the normal healthy alignment for our particular situation. Again, remembering that there's many ways of being human. So we don't, we are not all going to look like this, no matter what we try to do, but we can all improve according to our own situation. That's a basic, we could say that's another belief that we have another backbone principle is that we can all improve. You saw this picture on the page when you signed up and I like it because it really shows, I think, what a lot of us really want in our lives, which is this ability to be out on terrain, in nature, unpredictable, on over distances, carrying a backpack and enjoying life. Yeah. Hmm. And, you know, these feelings for a lot of this don't go away no matter what your age. I remember when my grand, great grandmother was in her 80s she was still wanting to go mushroom hunting, morel mushroom hunting. And she still had fantasies about getting up out of her situation, which she had many kyphotic, uh, many thoracic fractures. She'd been run over. We were raised on farms. She'd actually been run over by cattle at one point, which definitely did not help her already tendency to round posture. She was a slight little woman with very little meat on her bones, not very tall. And she did hard, heavy farm work. So she had a lot of disadvantages as she was going into her eighties, but still, even though she was not able to really stand and do much anymore, she was dreaming about the ability to get out and go morel mushroom hunting, right? We still want these things in our lives. So anything that we do that moves us in this direction of vitality, we will take in and go, oh, wow, yeah, okay, that's something. I got something new going on for me. Now, it's, it's life. So it's a journey of organic learning. 
It's a journey of organic learning. It's a journey of learning to live from the inside out. So it's not about prescriptive changes. It's not about telling you exactly how to stand, how to move, how to do this, how to do that. It's about you discovering for yourself what works for you right now and takes you in a new direction that seems positive to you in this moment. And then these moments layer together for more changes. There'll be things happen in life, sets you back, but you have a tool set that you can use to keep bringing yourself back out, to have more resiliency, to navigate that uneven territory. But something that happens that sets you back you can get yourself back up and going again. Now I'd like to share this case study of Sharana and just look at that beautiful, beautiful smile. I mean, it's such a great smile. Sharana is uh, 74, 74. And um, she has a scoliosis. Scoliosis is what you see in this spine picture on the right where the spine, instead of being somewhat aligned, this is a frontal view of her spine and it curves in an S-curve pattern. It's, this one is not quite 42 degrees. So hers is a little more significant and 42 degrees is a significant curve. On the left, I couldn't find a real X-ray. So this is a little overly straight, but on the left, we would see a frontal view of the spine and it is mostly straight in the frontal view if you don't have scoliosis. Now there are more than one type of scoliosis. Um, some of you, some of us, some of me has a functional scoliosis. It comes from how I've used myself over the years or injuries that have happened. And then there's this type of scoliosis, which is called idiopathic, which means they don't know what causes it, but it sets on usually in adolescence and then continues to get worse. She also has degenerative disc disease and spondylosis. So basically like an arthritis in the spine. Now here's the things that she tried. She's a lively woman, by the way, and maybe we'll get our interview edited for you soon that you can see it. But um, here's the things that she tried. So she went to her family physician and she said, I'm, she wasn't, she didn't even know she had scoliosis then. What she knew is that she had really rounded posture. She's a retired social worker, has always been active, loves learning new things. And she um, went to her family physician and, you know, probably an annual visit. And she says, I want to work with my posture. And her physician said, there's nothing wrong with your posture. Now, Sharon is not unintelligent. She knows there's something wrong with her posture. She knows it's not right. But so she has this experience that unfortunately, I'm sure her family physician thought that she was doing something right for her by releasing her from the need to try to correct it. But she wasn't. She wasn't helping her. First of all, Sharana wants help with that issue. And to say it's not a non-issue is to not hear her. But also, as you heard me say earlier, posture and balance and fall risk are connected. They're absolutely connected. So she goes, well, I'm on my own on this. So she found a, um, somebody who did yoga. And um, in fact, she eventually found somebody who did yoga for scoliosis. And she, the, for the first round of yoga, she thought maybe as she loves yoga, maybe not helping her so much. The round of yoga with scoliosis, she thought, she thought maybe that was helping her. It was a lot of private sessions, very expensive. She wasn't sure she could keep that up. She went to rebounding and she uh, did rebounding on a trampoline. I might have the order of these wrong now that I look at this, but we'll pretend that this is the right order. Rebounding on a trampoline. And she loved that. She did that for about a year. When she commits to something, she really commits to it. Then she goes to an orthopedist who diagnoses her with scoliosis and these other items. And he says, rebounding is not good for you with scoliosis. No, it's collapsing you. It's compressing you. Do not do that. She did physical therapy. Uh, I think she had at least four physical therapists over this time frame, And she also did the Scroth method for scoliosis, which is another form of physical therapy. Now, she did the Scroth method for a whole year, an hour a day. And it turns out that when 
she was re-looked at, her scoliosis had got worse, had gotten worse. So she was discouraged. Now, you know, that she wasn't told that she had scoliosis earlier, I see as a disadvantage. Again, something that sometimes physicians don't tell us things that we don't think we can do anything about. But you can and need to do things if you have scoliosis to help yourself get your full life um, capacity out of your, your particular way of doing and being human. So it's unfortunate that she did not find out about this because she's the kind of person who would have worked with it earlier until she saw the orthopedist. And this would have been a couple of years before 2022. Whoops, and that's when she decided she had to find something completely different. And so she found out about Bones for Life. It was 2022. And she describes it as a magical process in learning. She's never been in a class where I can do the same movement multiple times and learn something different every time, never getting bored. She loves the fact that there's 90 Bones for Life processes, which she said sounds like a lot, but it turns out that they just keep all helping you around this issue of dynamic postural balance. She's so much happier with her posture. And when she went back to her physical therapist, uh, after have hadn't seen her for a couple of years, the physical therapist said, you stayed stable. And Sharana understood that this was a really good thing that at her age with the issues that she had to be able to be stable at that age with the issues that she had was incredible. That alone is progress. She also had back pain uh, that developed in, uh, within that journey before she came to Bones for Life. That's I think might be why she saw the orthopedist was the back pain. And that has improved greatly. She has had family members with healthcare issues where she feels like she really has to be the main um, strong person within the, the unit and taking care and helping them. She loves to walk on the track regularly and she gets a big kick out of the fact that once in a while she bypasses much younger people on her speed walking. So I feel like Sharon is a great example as someone that uh, is making the most out of their life and whatever their genetic potential and what has happened in their life before. And she's using Bones for Life in a way that really works for her. She said it becomes a part of your life and it feels like it's something you take with you everywhere. And she can do something on the track. She can do something on the sidewalk. She can do something wherever she wants to in order to be able to make an improvement for herself. Uh, yeah, so I feel very inspired by Sharana. I remember when she joined and she, um, she was a voracious learner, wanted to know more and more and more. And she really, yeah, you want to be like her, says Kelly. That's right. She really was able to enter this world of organic learning where the questions that we ask ourselves and our attempt to answer it, instead of getting the answer directly right from the teacher, being told exactly what to do is more important, is more important, is more important. So let's see what Andrea has to share with us now so that we can get some more improvement and then we'll do our post uh, scale afterwards. Good, okay, so. I'm going to lead you through a process. Uh, and this one comes from the second immersion. So it's going to call on some more movement uh, than those that first one we went through. So please listen to yourself. If it starts to feel like it's a little overwhelming, you can pause, you can watch, you can imagine the movement. All of these things um, bring about some benefit. So we'll move together as much as it feels good to you and as much as you can assess this 20% thing, which is something we can talk more about when we work together some more, but it means that it never feels like it's straining and it never feels like it's catching you off guard or that you can't 
pay attention to the rest of yourself. And it certainly means you can just feel a little bit of what that 20% is giving you. So I'd like you to sit on your chair close to the front, like we saw Brian before. The feet are flat on the floor, okay? And that your back is off of the back of the chair, if that's possible for you, okay? First thing I'm gonna ask you to do is turn your head very easily to one side in one direction, and then bring it back to look back forward. And let's stay with that one direction and do that a few more times, okay? The same direction, look that way. And then look back forward, just as though someone you love has called your name and you just turned and easily looked at them. And as you do this, maybe once or twice more, think to yourself, what is the quality of this movement for me? Does it feel easy or is there some stiffness? Is there a catch? Okay, let's try the other side to assess if there's a difference between the two. Someone you love called your name over there. And then you come back to look forward. And again, we'll do this maybe three or four times just so you can learn from your experience how that feels today. Okay. So is one side for you better than the other? And better would be easier. Yeah, that feels like there's less constriction. And so the side that is not as, as easy, we'll call that the side we want to improve, the side we want to improve. And if you can't quite tell, they both felt very similar, just choose one, okay? Now we're gonna take the side that we want to improve, the arm, and we're gonna stretch it forward in front of you. So I'm just gonna back my seat up a little bit so you can see more of me. I'm gonna stretch that arm forward in front of me as though someone's walked in the room and I'm reaching for them. And then I'm gonna bring that arm back down, okay? I'm gonna take my other side, the other hand that I'm not reaching forward, and I'm gonna put it to my low back like we did before when we were feeling the curve of our low back. Then we're gonna see if I can feel anything in my low back when I reach my arm forward, anything. That's a weird thing to ask, right? Do I feel as though there's any movement in my low back? You gotta listen, right? And it's subtle. It's very subtle. And maybe the answer today is no. I don't feel anything. Maybe you feel a little bit. Now that's okay. I'm gonna see if you can feel a little more by doing something slightly different. So the same arm, the side we want to improve, we're gonna reach that arm forward. And this time I'm gonna ask you to bend that elbow and turn the palm towards the ceiling, okay? And then when I stretch that arm forward, I'm gonna turn my palm down so my thumb turns down towards the floor and the palm is turned away from me. I'm gonna do that a few times. So if that was confusing, we're gonna add what we call a spiral to the arm. Okay, so as I reach forward, I'm turning my thumb down. And you begin to listen to your back as you do that. Maybe, maybe you feel some more integration, more connection to the ribs. Okay, very nice. So something about this spiral is inviting more of my body to be a part of that arm that reaches forward, okay? So side I wanna improve. I'm going to reach both of my arms forward and the side I want to improve, I'm going to place on top, okay? Crossed wrists, then turn my palms to face one another, interlace those fingers and reach those fingers forward in front of me. Now I'm going to twist towards the bottom arm and then come back. Now this movement isn't meant to feel like it's straining you in any way. At this moment, it's just really curious. Could be something very different, never done before. And you notice for yourself that your back might be moving as you do that, your ribs, maybe your shoulders, you can see my shoulders are moving. And is it possible without strain to bring that shoulder towards your face? That might be an interesting thing to play with. Good, and let's take a break. We'll just soften the arms and bring them down by our sides. This is a great moment to feel whether or not, oh, that might've been more than 20%. <laughs> that might've been more if I'm feeling like, oh, a lot of relief in my shoulders. Maybe next time when we do it again in a moment, you'll have a little bit of an easier experience with yourself, less effort. 
Okay, so again, our arms go forward. Okay, the same side you want to improve is going on top. We turn our palms to face each other. Interlace the fingers only so that we can get a little closer of a, a draw of those hands and then reach your fingers forward spiral down towards the arm below, perhaps the shoulder gets closer to my face. And now I'm going to draw a circle in front of myself. Yeah, as though I'm just, you know, in the air drawing a circle about the size of a plate, maybe a dinner size plate. And I'm looking forward as I do this. And I'm gonna go the other direction for a couple. I'm in that spiral as I do it. I'm feeling movement in my back. Feeling movement in my back. Very nice. And then I'm going to soften my arms and bring them all the way down. I take a moment to feel myself, to feel my breath, to notice the neck, to feel easy in my neck, to feel my feet on the ground. Now, those of us who feel comfortable standing, I'm gonna invite you to stand now. And this next few steps of this process will be nicer standing if it's available to you. Okay, so let's come now to that. Move my little seat away. Okay, so in standing, I'm gonna do the same side I want to improve on top, and I'm gonna cross my arms down the front of me. Okay, turn the palms to face one another, interlace the fingers, and then reach those arms straight down towards the floor, okay? I'm gonna to twist towards that bottom arm. Remembering, come out of your twists, so we can try a few twists. Remembering the twist is easy. And that smaller might bring you more benefit, might bring you more benefit. Why is that? So that you might listen to the movement deeper within yourself, rather than the strain or the effort. The next time you twist, let's hold it. And we're gonna draw a circle, keeping our arms fastened to the front of ourselves. So I'm moving my hips and my ribs and my whole lower body as I make these, this circle in front of myself. And as I do this, I'm gonna look into the distance. I'm gonna breathe easy and try to soften some extra effort within and enjoy the movement. Let's reverse the circle. I'm fastening these arms to my body, right? I'm holding them right against myself. And then I'm gonna pause the circle and we're gonna stay in this, this shape here and we're gonna bounce on our heels. Let's try. Pum, 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 one more, pum, pum and let all of that go. Take a moment to sense yourself and feel and what might be shifting and what are you receiving from this? Is there ease inside of this standing? It could be something very nourishing for the way in which you could improve this upright standing. The next position is behind us. So the same side I want to improve, that side goes on top, which is closer to my body. I'm gonna turn around so you can see my position here. And I've crossed my wrists, my fingers are reaching down, okay? I'm gonna try and twist. I'm gonna try and twist a little. Now this is a curious action. As I twist a little, I'm feeling that rotation going down towards the floor, but I'm also gonna soften my knees and I'm gonna think about the crown of my head lengthening upward and I'm gonna let this be easy for myself. The next time I twist, I'm gonna hold that position and draw a circle with my hips and my arms. Okay, I'm just turning around so you can see me. You can stay facing forward drawing this, this circle and let's reverse the circle none of this should feel as though it's painful it's just an interesting thing i can listen to and move with very good and now let's pause and hold this shape and look into the distance and bounce on our heels pum 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 pum, 
pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, one more, pum pum. And release those arms, easy, soft. And notice the changes or the sensation of standing. Or where in your world would you like to stand like this? In front of whom? In what conditions? Do we feel more present in ourselves? More, more in our own bodies in this moment? I have two more variations for this process. If you've had enough, you can watch. If you wanna explore some more, come along with me. We're gonna slide our hands along the front of ourselves and go all the way up above our head. The side we wanna improve goes in front and we turn the palms to face each other. I'm just gonna come down a little so you can see my hands. See how that's the same as I've done in front of me and down low. I'm gonna stand up again so you can see that I'm going to twist a little bit of rotation as I reach my arms up towards the ceiling. And I'm softening my knees and feeling my feet on the ground so that I'm very clear that I'm not straining. The next time I twist, I'm gonna fasten my arms to the sides of my face and draw a circle in the air. Not too big, but enough that it's interesting and enjoyable. And let's go the other direction and you can feel the ribs moving and the head moving. And your eyes are out on the distance, not looking down, but straight out into the distance. And then pause in the middle and let's bounce on heels. Pum, 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 one more, pum, pum. And let's slide those hands down slowly over our face as though we're coming smoothly down the front of our bodies. And we pause and feel this. Is there something fresh, restored, renewed within? And let's try one more and finish this process with this last variation. So I'm gonna take my arm that I'd like to improve and I'm gonna slide that one up the front of me and all the way to the ceiling. And then the other arm, I'm gonna stretch behind my back and down the middle of my backside. Okay, so there's the back view. Okay, I'm gonna turn my palm out so my pinky finger is facing my body. I'm gonna turn the palm out on the overhead arm so my thumb is towards the front and the palm is out. And I'm gonna stand tall here and reach these two arms in their opposite directions while looking out into the distance. I'll take another breath, maybe soften everything and then try it again, reach as though spiraling one arm down and the other arm up. And pause here, let's bounce on heels. Pum, 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 pum. Pum, 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 one more, pum, pum. And let's slide this overhead arm down the front of ourselves and all the way down and let the arms just be at their sides, at your sides. Look into the distance and feel the breath within your body. And let's see if anything's shifted in that side we wanted to improve, shall we? We're just gonna easefully take a look over that shoulder and. If someone you love just called your name, you look to the side and you come back to center. Notice if perhaps there's more ease there for you. You might try it again just to be sure. Huh, is that improved for you? And let's try the other side and see if that side's still as nice as it was or maybe it would like an improvement now too. <laughs> Very good, very nice. You might take a little walk to feel how that moves through you and know that we'll talk more about walking tomorrow. Beautiful, thank you so much, Andrea. So just stand for a moment or sit at the front of your chair so that you can come back to these things that I asked you about. Yeah, some of you got wows. I'll let, let me give you a minute to write your wows because 
it's important that you get a chance to say what you want to say about, about that particular process. Mm -hmm. Deborah said, a lot less pinched. Penn said, wow. I know some of you had questions above. Lewis said, shoulder eased. Oh, good, shoulder ease, yeah. That's so good. So much ease, felt the overhead ones the most, arms feel longer, it felt good. So caring, compassionate to my body. Yes, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, good. So uh, we had a lot of questions and definitely when something hurts, you don't do it. We just don't do it. We do it and it, we, it, we see if we can make some modifications. If we can't make a modification, then don't do it. Do it in your imagination. It never helps you in Bones for Life to do something that hurts. So in this work, we want you to stay super, super safe. And we don't want your nervous system getting all, oh my gosh, I'm going to hurt myself again. There it is. I'm going down that road where I always end up with that neck pain. Or I always end up with that back pain. So I really appreciate the, those of you who did have trouble just saying, I'm not going to do this. That's a great thing. Or I'm going to do it in my imagination. Okay. So now I had this question for you earlier right? About your posture. So if you want to stand for a moment and feel it that way, if you want to sit at the front of your chair, and I asked you to rate yourself on the postural happiness scale. Now, again, you're not trying to make yourself stand some way. You're just seeing how you stand right now, right? How your weight is on your feet, what the shape of your spine is that like, where your head is. And I gave you the scale of one is UG and two is 10 is yippee, I'm rocking it. One is UG and 10 is yippee, I'm rocking it. What's your number now? And when you're ready, put your pre and post number in the chat. So tell us your pre number first and your post number. Let's see if there's any differences between your pre and post numbers on your posture. Okay, two, three, two, five, four, eight, six, six point five, four, seven, eight, one, one to nine, seven to nine seven to six. You're welcome, Betsy. Uh, three to six, four to five, three to four, one, and now about a four, three to eight, four to seven, nine to 10. Beautiful. And it's okay if you went down. It doesn't mean that this work isn't for you. It means we've got more work to do to help, to help you, but we could do it. So now let's try the other one. Remember we had something else, which was in terms of your stability. So if your posture improved, I wonder if it's your, your stability improved and you don't have to make it up, you can be totally honest. And remember if you're standing and you feel like you're a puff ball and you would just lose your balance very easily, that's a one. And if you could stand right now and you think, no, I think I could stand on my legs, one leg longer, maybe a minute on each one, or I could walk super slow or someone could bump into me and I would feel secure. That's a 10. So 10 is your fantastic, super balance. One is a puff ball. I'll lose it easily. When you assign your number for that, please come and put that in the chat as well. So stability, the same. Okay. Uh, one to two, seven to nine, eight, seven to nine, three to six, um, eight to nine, seven for balance, about the same five to seven, three to five, eight to nine, nine to 10, six to eight, one to five, it hasn't changed. That's a totally valid answer. Uh, they're coming so fast. Eight, still eight, seven, nine, eight, 10, seven, eight. Beautiful. So we've had some changes. We've made a deposit in that direction. We've made a deposit in that direction. And of course you may have other feelings. You may feel like the side of your neck feels freer. Something about your low back is easier. Um, we are just focusing on this particular one around fall wrist. And that's why I chose these two things for you to consider. Andrea, I think you have a, a quickish case study to tell us about. And um, before we stop in, which before we take the power moments, so you can enter the contest, your power moment. But let's take first from Andrea, this case study, which I know is really beautiful. Yeah, hi. So um, I've been teaching Bones for Life for 
uh, almost 10 years, which is exciting coming up on that uh, anniversary for myself. And I've worked with lots of different populations with Bones for Life. And so the story I have for you today is unique because it's a young person. Um, and often people think this work is just for those of us who are starting to lose things like stability or balance. Uh, and I, I truly believe this work is for all of us and uh, can really benefit your life. So um, I'm not going to use his name just for privacy's sake, but I'll refer to him as this young man who he was, wonderful person. I was teaching an acting class for movement. Um, and those of you who are not familiar with what that means in their first year of a concentrated uh, theater program, we work uh, very deeply on posture so that um, we can all come to a place where we feel we're getting rid of habits so that we can take on new habits of characterization and move from there. So step one, get to know myself, right? Get to know myself and then be able to arrive in this postural place that allows for me to have choice. So we can already hear how that resonates with Bones for Life, right? Um, so in come my lovely new class. I'm working with these people twice a week, which is just delightful. And I've decided to devote my whole time with them to Bones for Life work, just Bones for Life work. They come in at 18, 19 years old, uh, and they have all, if you have 18, 19 year old people in your life that you love and care for and you see a lot, you can see that they have as much postural um characteristics as we all do, right? Uh, maybe some have learned that they want to round over or they want to bring their head forward or their pelvis is tucked under, all these, these ways in which we inhabit our body. Um, and so the problem that we faced with with this gentleman is that we'd like to bring this ourselves back to this neutralized, very tall, vertical spine. And yet the issue inside of many of us is the way in which we stand is the way in which we know ourselves, right? We know ourselves. This is who I am. This is the image I want to project into the world. This is how I want people to perceive me, right? So this person's from a very urban environment, liked wearing hoodies, wanted to be rounded and forward, right? So this is the physical body. And then when he would lie on the ground, it would started to feel really uncomfortable because the ground is unbiased. It's not a soft and cushy space. And so it asked the body, his body to be very open in the front. And that was not the way that he was carrying himself on the regular, right? We would take cushions and fill in gaps and make sure there was comfort there because the first step in our journey together was making sure, as you were hoping to feel today, safe, right? That this journey in Bones for Life is about self-discovery and about engaging in a process that is safe for yourself, not going to bring you into places that are um, dramatically challenging and create pain or discomfort or dissonance within yourself, right? So as that process started to develop, he began to get this relationship within himself and began to feel these smaller movements, just as we did today, lengthening neck and low back, lying on the floor, moving the, the curves of the spine. There's these moments of awareness, like, huh, I wonder what would happen if, if I could relax my shoulders, or I wonder what would happen if my pelvis could release down, right? So this inquiry started to build. And I remember this delightful moment about maybe a month or so into our work together, where we were doing a movement on our backs, where we're reaching up in the air. You'll learn this one. It's quite fun. And we call it back crawling. And, and he found this movement in his rib cage that was so delightful. He started to laugh and we all had fun with him. And it was a, a really nice breakthrough where this movement was introduced into his vocabulary, discovered within, and felt like a freedom moment, right? I felt like this freedom thing, not scary, not uh, a removal of a self-image, but rather an embracing of more choice and more possibilities. But the big moment, and this is the one I'm leading to in the end of my story, happened towards maybe another month later when we were standing and doing some of the very same things we did today. And uh, I asked if he would come in front of the room so we could take a look at some of these changes that were occurring. And he took his hand to his neck and he took this other hand to his low back and he found the length within himself. 
And I turned to him and I was just looking and I said, how does this feel? And he just had tears spring from his eyes and he said, it feels easy. It feels like home, right? So then I said, okay, so let's go back to this other posture that you love so much too. And anyone back there, right? And I said, how does that feel? He said, it feels like home too. And I said, great. And now you have another choice, another choice. And so he came back to this, you know, stacked, proportionally flexible place that he had discovered within himself and walked around the room and felt the freedom of the adaptability that he had now discovered within himself. Yeah, quite delightful. That's so beautiful. And I, I love Andrea, how you uh, were able to not create any kind of sense of shame about where you had been, right? It's not about being right or wrong, but it's, it, it's about having options, having choices, dynamic postural balance, dynamic postural balance. Ooh. Okay, it's time for a power moment. If you would enter into the comments, hashtag power moment, and then tell us what was the most powerful moment for you today. You can have one entry um, per session and you'll be placed in a raffle. The raffle will get you, the grand prize winner will win a private online session where I'll help you with whatever movement, physical, musculoskeletal issue you have on that session, just you and me. And then there will be four runner ups, which will get lifetime access to this replay series. The rest of you are going to have limited access to it, but four of you will get lifetime access to this replay series. So again, we would write in there, hashtag power moment, whatever your power moment is, and then list your name as you registered, because some of you have really unusual names here that you didn't register with. So register your um so it would be hashtag power moment, the item, and then your name. Now, if you're watching this on replay, you can still participate in this uh, contest and in this anchoring of a learning. And that is by doing it in the Facebook group. So we, we have a two places. You can show up live on Zoom or you come to the Facebook group and there'll be a post later that'll say, list your power moment for session one here. And you will list it there in that section. Beautiful. Look at those coming in. So we're going to get ready to go into Q&A. So uh, I love reading these, though. I want to take all the time in the world just to read them all out loud now. But I know you have not enough time for me to do that. So I'm going to take my time to read them later and be inspired because it's always inspiring for me to read those these moments that stood out for you. Oh. OK, 